Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Miller, and the SCP we're going to be looking at today is SCP-5692. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-5692 is currently held in a modified humanoid containment chamber at Site-29. The cell has altered temperature or atmospheric conditions to accommodate the subject's physiology, the specifications of which are outlined in Document 5692-11. SCP-5692 is to be fed a concentrated mixture of amino acids, simple sugars, and ionic phosphates every 12 to 15 hours. The specifications for the preparation of this mixture are outlined in Document 5692-13. Class A amnestics are authorized to be used on all parties associated with the containment of SCP-5692-A instances. Specific methods for the containment of instances of SCP-5692-A are to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis by participating operatives. Contained instances of SCP-5692-A are to be held in Site-29 with containment conditions appropriate to their physiological needs. These conditions may be determined through research of the subject or by using information provided by the subject. Further information regarding each contained instance of SCP-5692-A can be found on Documents 5692-37-109. Behavior and prior activities of SCP-5692, as well as instances of SCP-5692-A, are currently being conducted under the supervision of Dr. Werner, head of the Extraterrestrial Anomaly Division of Site-29. Any concerns or inquiries regarding the research or containment of SCP-5692 or instances of SCP-5692-A are to be directed to Dr. Werner. Description SCP-5692 is a slug-like sapient organism of extraterrestrial origin measuring 2.3 meters in length and folded backwards at the midpoint of its body to allow its anterior half to be aligned perpendicular to the ground. SCP-5692 possesses a head with a pair of large red eyes, an elongated, tube-shaped mouthpart, and two clusters of small pores on either side designed to facilitate respiration. SCP-5692 possesses a pair of stalk-like organs on either side of its torso, each ending in a round sensitive organ capable of sprouting a number of flexible mycelium-like protrusions at will. The protrusions have been confirmed by SCP-5692 to be a means of reproduction and environmental manipulation. SCP-5692 is a dull orange in color with dark and light countershading similar to many marine animals. SCP-5692 was recovered on October 2014 from a small cabin in a forest near Oregon after several reports of UFO activity in the region were investigated by Foundation operatives. The incident was contained without incident and upon being confronted by operatives, SCP-5692 surrendered willingly into Foundation custody. SCP-5692 has been cooperative with Foundation staff since its containment and appears to answer most inquiries with sincerity. SCP-5692 is able to communicate using a small electronic device embedded directly in its nervous system at the point where structures analogous to a brain and ocular nerves meet. According to SCP-5692, the device is a translator capable of processing various methods of visual communication, including written words and the movement of lips, and directly implanting the abstract concepts they represent into the brain of SCP-5692. This device is also capable of converting the thoughts of SCP-5692 into audible words and or holographic projections of written language using a speaker or holographic emitter located directly below the skin between its eyes. Using this device, SCP-5692 can understand the top 250 most common spoken and written languages on Earth, as well as several hundred forms of extraterrestrial communication. SCP-5692 claims that due to its placement, removal of this device would instantly result in its death. Removal of this device for further study is not authorized. SCP-5692 is responsible for the integration of 50 to 55 extraterrestrial life forms. 
designated instances of SCP-5692-A into Earth societies and ecosystems between the years of 2001 and 2014, 42 of which have been successfully contained. The appearances and reasons for appearing on Earth vary drastically among instances of SCP-5692-A. All instances of SCP-5692-A are sapient and have previously engaged in business transactions with SCP-5692. The whereabouts and activity of all contained instances of SCP-5692-A were provided to Foundation personnel by SCP-5692 shortly after its initial containment. Addendum 5692-1 The following is an incomplete list of contained instances of SCP-5692-A. The recovery of all subjects took place within a few months of the containment of SCP-5692. Many instances of SCP-5692-A disguised themselves using a complex organic gel accompanied by a convincing prosthetic skin covering. The composition of the gel varies depending on the physiology of the subject and is designed to simulate the musculature of the subject's assumed identity. The gel is able to respond to neural inputs from the subject and is controlled as if it were the subject's own body. All instances of SCP-5692-A observed thus far possess a translation or communication device similar to the one observed in SCP-5692. All human identities assumed by instances of SCP-5692-A are of people that had not existed prior to the subject's arrival on Earth and were accomplished by the forging of relevant documents. Instance number SCP-5692-A3 Description a reptilian humanoid entity measuring 1.8 meters in height. The entity could change its outward appearance to resemble any human to an indistinguishable degree. Reasons for appearing on Earth are currently under investigation. Remains of the subject are currently held in Site-29's biolab. Recovery Report The subject was found to be posing as a politics professor at university for several years. It is unknown if this is the only identity the subject assumed while on Earth. Upon discovery by Foundation operatives, the subject injected itself with an unknown chemical compound that converted its bodily tissues, excluding its skin, into a thick, green basic solution resulting in death in a matter of seconds. Additional information provided by SCP-5692 I'm not entirely sure why he came to me. He was more than capable of hiding on his own, and by the sounds of things, he had some pretty powerful friends. Instance number SCP-5692-A11 Description An organism superficially resembling a rodent with hairless white skin and measuring 0.8 meters in length. The subject possesses five prehensile tails capable of manipulating its environment and lacks hind limbs, ears, and nostrils. The subject was apparently on Earth to hide from an extraterrestrial crime organization that it was formerly affiliated with. Recovery Report The subject adopted the false identity of Ricky Bambino Buscelli and engaged in organized criminal activity in Chicago for a period of several years. The subject was contained without incident. On several occasions since its initial containment, the subject has offered to exchange information about its former crime affiliates both terrestrial and extraterrestrial, in exchange for freedom or special containment privileges. Additional information provided by SCP-5692. Once a rat, always a rat. Instance number SCP-5692-A14. Description. A silicon-based organism measuring 0.27 meters in length, resembling a translucent gray cephalopod with four limbs, and a cartilaginous endoskeleton. The subject was required to regularly consume sand to facilitate its bodily needs. According to the subject, it is a refugee of a massive interstellar war surrounding the Kepler-22 star system. Recovery Report The subject used a highly specialized gel capable of supporting its metabolism and maintaining a convincing disguise as a common house cat. The subject posed as a family pet in a Toronto apartment for several years before being recovered by Foundation operatives while attempting to feed stray cats outside its apartment complex at night. Additional information provided by SCP-5692 All the essentials come free, 
and all you have to do is sit by the window when it's sunny. Honestly, sounds like a pretty good gig, except for having to eat the litter. Instance number, SCP-5692, A-23. Description, a complex network of extraterrestrial algae, forming structures analogous to neurons and synapses. The resulting entity is a sapient photosynthetic mat at the water's surface, capable of splitting into separate intelligences and regrouping multiple of these intelligences into a single entity. One isolated intelligence occupied a gel-based disguise of a 60 to 65-year-old Caucasian male. The totality of the subject is currently held in 27 large containment vats in the ecological anomaly section of Site-29. Recovery Report The disguised portion of the subject was found to live in a small house at the edge of a swamp in the Florida Keys. Locals knew the individual as a reclusive eccentric known as Bayou Bill. All information surrounding Bayou Bill was successfully removed from the surrounding area. Most of the subject was growing in a 3.4 kilometer radius surrounding the house, causing major disturbances in the local ecosystem. The total recovery of the subject took 24 days due to its sprawling decentralized nature. Despite claiming that its purpose on the planet was to research aquatic life forms, it is now believed that the subject was taking advantage of the environmental conditions of the swamp for growth and reproduction, the end goal of which remains uncertain. Additional information provided by SCP-5692 What? You think it was planning a takeover? I doubt it. Come on now. How was I supposed to know anyway? He could fit in a glass of water when I met him. Besides, if your planet's weak enough to be conquered by seagrass, maybe that's just natural selection. Instance number SCP-5692, A-29 Description A 1.3 meter long superficially mammalian creature resembling a snake with shaggy brown fur and two sets of thermosensitive organs directly below its eyes. The subject's tail diverged into seven points, which acted as environmental manipulators. The subject also has a litter of 57 purely aquatic offspring that each measures 7 to 10 centimeters in diameter, and resemble sea urchins with soft, flexible hairs rather than spines. The subject reportedly sought to escape overpopulation regulations on its home planet that would require it to terminate 42 of its offspring. Recovery Report the subject was disguised as a 34-year-old female botanist living in a small town along the Mexico-US border. The subject kept its offspring in pet aquariums in the back of their flower shop. Upon initial containment, the subject was extremely hostile, but became cooperative after accommodations were made to allow the subject and offspring to be contained together. Additional information provided by SCP-5692 Oh yeah, I remember her. Gave her a discount, I think. Never let it be said that I don't have a heart. Instance number SCP-5692, A-32 Description A 1.5 meter tall, vaguely humanoid organism with several avian features including a toothed beak, a blue downy feather-like skin covering designed for thermal regulation, and talon-like hands and feet. According to the subject and SCP-5692, the species to which the subject belongs has an average lifespan of 16 years. The subject cited tourism as its reason for appearing on Earth. The remains of the subject are preserved and held in Site-29's biolab. Recovery Report The subject spent the last two years of its life posing as a wealthy 70 to 75-year-old Turkish man. Using this disguise, the subject visited numerous sites of natural and historical significance on every continent. The subject entered willingly into Foundation custody after being seized by operatives at Machu Picchu, claiming that it had seen enough. The subject died three weeks after initial containment. Additional information provided by SCP-5692 The man led a military coup, became the leader of his planet, reared four children, cured an infectious skin disease in his spare time, faked his death emigrated on a whim to an underdeveloped planet he heard rumors of in a bar one day, and experienced everything your planet had to offer, all within the span of a decade. We have a saying about the birds where I come from. They're insane. Instance number SCP-5692-A37 
Description A 2.4 meter tall, slender humanoid entity with thin, transparent skin. The entity lacks muscle fibers and moves by controlling the movement of pressurized gas through specialized organs in its limbs. The subject was native to a low-gravity planet and came to Earth to study the relationship between trees and fungi in the forests of North America. Recovery Report The subject was outfitted with a gel-based disguise and a device which could manipulate gravity in a 10-centimeter radius around its body. The disguise was made to resemble the North American cryptid Sasquatch. The subject was found in the Rocky Mountains of Alberta and was apprehended without incident. Additional information provided by SCP-5692 She was too tall for a human gel, and she wanted to live in the woods for the rest of her life. Not bad, eh? Well, I thought it was pretty clever. Research into the location, nature, and capabilities of the civilizations that instances of SCP-5692-A originate from is ongoing. Interviews with SCP-5692 and instances of SCP-5692-A have thus far proven useful in obtaining information. However, more direct methods of observation are currently in development. Interview Log 5692-3 Preface The following interview took place on November 2014. In the prior two interviews, SCP-5692 revealed the location and identities of 42 instances of SCP-5692-A. SCP-5692 claimed that the total number of SCP-5692-A instances on Earth was between 50 and 55, and that it had forgotten the location and identities of the remaining instances. The purpose of this interview was to obtain more information regarding the circumstances surrounding the presence of SCP-5692 on Earth. Playing log now. Hello, 5692. I have a few questions regarding your involvement in the presence of extraterrestrial organisms on Earth. Is that all right? Yeah. I'm sure I can make time for it. Excellent. How did you arrive on Earth initially? Well, Earth belongs to a collection of planets that, for one reason or another, are forbidden by interstellar law to contact. In your case, it appears to be a non-interference type deal. Honestly, it's not like anyone is missing out on anything. I don't find this place nearly as interesting or endearing as some of my customers do. Either way, a good place to hide. And as I came to discover, make a profit while I'm at it. Hide? Hide from what? More appropriate to ask from who, and even more appropriate to ask who I'm not hiding from. Are you a fugitive? You make it sound like I'm dangerous. I pulled one too many fast ones, and before I knew it, eight of the fifteen largest government powers in the galaxy were on to me. Many of which, might I add, think execution is an appropriate punishment for stealing at your Kokomo, much less. Let's call them dishonest business dealings. Earlier, you referred to the extraterrestrials you assisted as customers. What sort of payment did they provide you for your services? Well, first off, their ship. They'd give up their ship and everything on it, along with a package of additional goods, depending on where the customer came from. I'd do my research ahead of time. What were some of these goods? Stuff that's universally valuable. You know, precious metals, black market organic materials, illegal technology, stuff like that. That way I could trade them in for whatever currency made the most sense when I got back to the Grift. So, once they made their deal with you, they had no way of getting off world? Ah, that was the beauty of it. If you are desperate enough to relocate for the rest of your life, then you're probably also willing to shell out an arm, leg, or equivalent appendage. Plus, you couldn't go and tell your friends about your vacation on Earth after you left. Last thing I wanted was to attract unwanted attention. Once you're in, you are in. That was rule number one. What were the other rules? Common sense stuff, you know. No transmissions off-world. Avoid doctors, cops, or anyone wearing a tinfoil hat. You get it. In exchange, they knew I would keep quiet and they could safely do... Well, whatever they came here to do without being harassed. So why 
Why did you decide to give up information about your customers to us? They provided you things of immense value for your secrecy. Well, I can't trade in any of those things for money now. And even if I could, what good would it do me in here? No, they can live like me now. What's the saying? Our goose is cooked. They knew the risks when they broke the interstellar law. Although I'm sure if they knew this was a concealer world, they might have thought twice. A concealer world? Yeah, you know. A world with a big shadowy organization that hunts down things that don't make total sense. The Tribunal of the Karmok. The Blinesh Authority. The Octagon Order. There's at least half a dozen others. You guys are unique, though. In what ways? Well, you make some of the other guys look sloppy. I lived here for 13 years and I never once suspected there was such an organization on this planet. Well done. I'm usually pretty good at spotting these sorts of things. Most of them also prefer to terminate dangerous things rather than put them in a box. I was lucky you had the philosophy you did, otherwise it would have been no different than being executed for one of my harmless schemes. Well, mostly harmless. Any additional information you can provide about these organizations? It would be nice to know what our counterparts are up to. One thing all you guys have in common is that once you have someone in your sights, they're as good as yours. That's why I surrendered so easily when I saw you guys showing up to my cabin. I wonder if Keswick knew about you guys. Oh, that would make it even more infuriating. Well, I think that will do for today. We'll have to get you to expand on some of the points you've laid out here today at a later date. Yeah, yeah, sure. I got nothing better to do. End log. Final notes. This is the third time SCP-5692 brought up a person named Keswick. From what I could gather, Keswick is a person that assisted SCP-5692 in smuggling aliens onto Earth. I'll see what sort of intel we can gather on our own before questioning 5692. If the two are still working together, the information provided by 5692 may be intentionally misleading. Dr. Werner Interview Log 5692-4 Preface The following interview is conducted on November... 2014. In prior interviews, SCP-5692 had briefly alluded to the existence of an apparently non-anomalous human collaborator in his mid to late 30s known as Keswick. Subsequent interviews with instances of SCP-5692-A have shown that subjects are unaware of these specific events or entities involved in their integration and have only a vague recollection of the identity of Keswick and SCP-5692. Additional investigations were unsuccessful in uncovering additional information on Keswick. The purpose of this interview is to obtain more information on Keswick and his involvement in the presence of extraterrestrials on Earth. Playing log now. Hello, 5692. Are you ready for another interview? You know, if I were a little duller, I would try to get you to call me by my real name. But knowing this place, it seems unlikely. So I don't think I'm even going to tell you. I know your name, but you don't know mine. It shifts the power balance a little more in my favor, don't you think? Sure. Then may we start the interview now? All right, Vern. V-E-R-N. Vern. V-E-R-N. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you like that? It's Rain Man. Yes, I know. <laughs> Very charming. When did you see Rain Man? Keswick would bring me movies, books, basically whatever media I wanted between customers to keep me busy. A lot of Earth entertainment is pretty weak, but it can be very addictive. I suppose that explains how your speech is so colloquial. Even speaking through a translator. Ah, well, it's not enough to simply speak a language. When you interact with customers from a whole different world, it pays to give off a certain... familiarity. My charm is a well-known universal constant, Vern. Very nice. But if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you more about this Keswick individual you've mentioned in previous interviews. Oh, I've been waiting for this one. All right, let's get into it. 
What precisely was your role when in the interrogation of extraterrestrials on Earth? Well, I was responsible for receiving transmissions from customers, making the gel disguises, setting up the customers with the machines they need, educating the customer on Earth's customs, and of course, handling the bona fide treasure we'd acquired. Everything else fell on that Sorgook, Keswick. Can you tell me more about Keswick's role? He was responsible for finding accommodations, giving the customer enough to live on initially, forging documents, transporting the customer where they needed to go, stuff like that. He'd always alter with the memories of the customer in such a way that they had only a vague idea of who we were. It was safer that way. The customers always had no recollection of precisely how they got to where they were or who else was involved. So it's possible others were involved? I don't see how it could have been possible any other way. But the specifics were always a mystery. He'd always get anxious and irritable when asked about his methods. I quickly learned to stop questioning him. He was a good partner. It is part for next to nothing. In fact, he would lose money on every operation, and his payment was strange. Can you elaborate, please? Well, he would just ask to take bits of technology and biosamples from the stash for a month or two and then return them in perfect condition. He'd also spend a strange amount of time with some of the customers before relocating them. Where they were, or what they did during that time, is anyone's guess. Not even they remember. That was my first clue something was up with him. I always knew he was suspicious, but I could never resist having a partner that worked essentially for free. How did you come to be associated with Keswick to begin with? He found me, believe it or not. He claimed to be the owner of the cabin I was squatting in, but I knew that was a lie because the place looked like it had been empty for at least a decade. He was quiet and imposing. I thought he was about to kill me or turn me in, but instead he seemed to have some vague idea of who I was. He told me about a con where he would handle all of the heavy lifting, and I could be rich when the manhunt on me was over. Of course, I quite literally couldn't. Refuse. So the scheme was his idea? As much as I want to take credit, I can. Could you provide any information about Keswick that you've learned over your time working together? Anything that would help us locate him? Believe me, there's nothing I want to do more than bring this guy in, but he was so secretive. I'm pretty sure Keswick wasn't even his real name. Other than the occasional VHS or comic book drop-off, we pretty much never interacted outside of business. When was the last time you heard from Keswick prior to containment? About a week before, but I know he was responsible for me being here. Could you elaborate? You see, my species endures a molting period for a matter of days every few years in which we are unresponsive to the world outside our molting pots. When I exited my molting state, I checked the hiding spots with all the payments, only to find they were empty. All my other belongings, including the ships, were gone, and there was residue on the ground indicating that several ships had taken off. Then your boys in black came knocking within the hour, and I knew it was over. Very interesting. Thank you, 5692. I think we have everything we need for today. No problem. You can repay me by bringing in that Parmode Keswick. I'm sorry, Vern. Please don't take offense. I swear I become my father when I get angry. End log. Final notes. Assuming all this is reliable, we're left with more questions than answers. Was anyone else involved? If so, who? And for what reason? What did they need all this alien technology for? Regardless of the answers, finding this Keswick individual should be a top priority. Dr. Werner Following this interview, Keswick was designated Person of Interest 17235. Attempts to determine his whereabouts, current activities, and potential collaborators are ongoing. Okay, I think that about does it for today. Thank you for listening, if indeed you still are and you are all dismissed. Goodbye.
I would like to give a special thank you to Zargaran, Big Sip, O'Krapkai, Trey Adams, The Morrigan, James Saba, Irish Wristwatch, Lost Boy, Your Local Foundation Agent, Signar, Zazapan, Worthy Fire, Dr. Wolf 13, Cupster, Dean Dingus, Braided Peach, Rowan O'Brien, Kignac, Grimnir, Extra Moments 123, Swift Raw, and James Wright. If you would like a special thank you at the end of each of my videos, and some other cool stuff as well, visit patreon.com forward slash the Volgan. Thank you.